Welcome to the beautiful world of aquascaping. Guys, our next guest will not need any introduction because he is probably the most successful aquascaper alive. He has more prizes than you can imagine. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Josh Sim. Welcome to Green Aquas. Thank you. First of all, I want to congratulate you for your grand prize winning for IAPSC this year. Thank you very much. You have here an IAPSC champion, two times IAPSC champion, and only two people in the world can say that. You and Mr. Fukada. So congratulations. Thank again. you. When I started to think about what kind of prizes you have, I couldn't even enumerate. So you have two first places and you have another three first places in another international contest, the IAC and the, the Chinese Aquascaping Contest. You've got two times number four and you've got one number six. So you've got the five times top seven rankings. I think nobody else can say that in the world. When I asked you uh, what else you have and you said the rest are top 27. <laughs> This video is going to be much longer than usual because uh, I'm sure that Josh will talk about uh, so many interesting things that uh, this is going to be an in-depth uh, introduction to the world of uh, contest tanks and, and all those of you who just want to improve your tanks a little bit more can listen to what he says and it's going to be fantastic. Ladies and gentlemen, I give you Josh Sim and you see on the picture now what kind of prizes he has. So good luck with the presentation. If you want to know something about contest tanks, this is your man. He knows how to do contest tanks. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. It is a great pleasure to be here today. I'm not here today to teach you anything because there is nothing to teach in aquascaping. Nothing is right, nothing is wrong. What I'm here today is just to share with you my experience and also to learn from your experience and to make friends and to enjoy this hobby, not to teach. So this is the first thing that I want to say. And uh, I'm very glad to be here in Budapest, in Hungary. You know, I, I travel quite a lot for my work, for aquascaping event. In the past, when I tell my friends that I'm going to Paris, Munich, Shanghai, Tokyo, my friends will say, yeah, okay, so what? Everybody go to this, those kind of places. But this time, when I tell my friend I'm going to Budapest, my friends say, ooh, Budapest. <laughs> that makes me feel very proud. In the past, I only hear about Budapest in spice movie, like James Bond. So to me, Budapest is something very beautiful and mysterious. But I have to tell you that before today, or before I come, I know very little about Hungary. To me, as an aquascaper, Hungary is green aqua, green aqua is Hungary. Hopefully after today, I will know more about Hungary and to know many friends here. I'm not sure among the audience today, how many of you have not heard of me before, before today. Please raise your hand. I, I, don't worry, I will not kick you out from this workshop if you do not know me. <laughs> Any, anybody who haven't heard of me before, before this, before today? Good, I'm very famous here. <laughs> <laughs> Never mind, I'll just tell you a little bit about myself, maybe something that probably you would not know about me. First of all, I'm 46 years old. Yeah? Congratulations. Thank you. <laughs> Balash is also 46, but he looks like my father. <laughs> <laughs> because I'm not Asian. <laughs> I come from a small fishing village called Kukok in the southern part of Malaysia. So my grandfather, a few of my uncles are actually fishermen. At the moment, I only have one wife and three kids. And I do not plan to increase this number. <laughs> Why or kids? Enough. Aquascaping is not my full-time job. Yeah, I, I have a day job. Aquascaping is just my hobby. In the normal days, I'm in the manufacturing line. I produce stationery like pencil, pen, color pencil, highlighters and all this. So this is my job. I love cooking. Yeah, I'm the man chef in the house. Yeah, I, I, my, my kids love my cooking. The dish that they like the most, called McDonald's. When, when my wife is not around, I cook McDonald's for my kids. But I mean, joke aside, I really like cooking. I, li I like cooking a lot, yeah? And I like gardening as well, uh, but I like to grow things that I can eat, like vegetables, fruits, not flowers and all this, yeah? And actually, I like photography and painting. 
So as you can see, I'm a quite an artistic kind of guy. Today, I would like to maybe share with you some work of my photography and painting that I've done previously. My work is a little bit different. I would say a little bit dark, mysterious, uh, scary maybe. So it is not the normal kind of painting or, or photography that you used to see. This is the kind of photography that I liked. And that is my wife, heavily edited wife. This is a painting. This is a photography. A photography. I think this one I took in Paris. And that is also my wife. But and my wife doesn't smoke. I just thought that he looked sexier with a cigarette in her hand. So this is my favorite painting. I have this in my wallpaper for my phone for like five, six years. Yeah. And that is myself. What kind of camera do you use? A Canon 7D. Same camera that I use to take all my tanks. I also love dogs. I'm a dog person. And I love spicy food, which is not true. Actually, I love, simply love food, <laughs> yeah? Not only spicy food. Actually, I told Balash yesterday, before two months ago, I'm eight kilogram more than today. And because I had to come here and I know I'm on camera, I have to lose that eight kilogram just for this occasion, wow. yeah? And I will probably gain back this eight kilo before Christmas. I, I can Not promise you. Before you leave, because uh, food is exactly. I love Hungarian food. I tried yesterday already. Best. And as a football fan, I support Manchester United. I know they sucks now. Yeah, but as, as once a devil, always a devil. Just now was my private life. This is more aquascaping stuff. I'm in this hobby for 12 years. I belong to a small, small club called Little Green Corner. Yeah, it, only five person in this club. The main person only five, but now we have hundreds of them because after somebody got champion, then everybody want to join this club. I think water change is one of the more important things in this hobby. For me, I do, for my contest tank, I do three times water change a week. Yes, 20%, 30%, three times a week. I believe that if you do water change very often, it can minimize a lot of problems. Algae, uh, plants healthy. I follow this uh, regime, uh, this uh, schedule for like four or five years, and I never have algae problem in my tank. Yeah, so I think water change is very, very important. How long does it take for you to do a water change? My tank is five, five feet, 150 and 120. So one water change for one tank is probably 15, 20 minutes. Because I don't know, I'm not only sucking up siphoning out the water, I'm also cleaning all, all those uh, dirt. So it takes about 20 minutes. I love moss. I think this is uh, one of the more, most important plants in this hobby because it is so versatile. You can use it anywhere in the tank, in front, at the middle, at the back, bottom, middle, at top. Everywhere you can use these plants. And more importantly, you basically cannot kill moss. They grow anywhere. So I think this is a very important plant in our hobby. I have six tanks in my house. My wife is not impressed about this number, but <laughs> yeah. Uh, but out of these six tanks, only two tanks is for contest. And these are my contest tank dimension, five, five feet, two feet, two feet, which is 150, 60, 60. And 120, 60, 60. So these are only two contest tanks that I have. The other four tanks are mainly for plants, for farm. I call it farm tank. Tank shooting means uh, taking the final photo of the tank. Uh, to me personally, I think that this is the most stressful things about this hobby. Because you know, you, you work for four months, five months, six months, and whether you success or not, all come down to this single moment when you click the shutter. Whether you are good or you're bad, that one click de decide your whole years of hardship. So to me, when I, whenever I shoot my tank, I'm very nervous. And I shoot my tank all by myself. One person, uh, including chasing the fish, setting up and blowing the head dry, everything, one person, I do it myself. And I always do it at middle of the night, not middle of the night, when everybody is asleep. And I'm alone in the house and I would shoot this tank for maybe three, four hours, one tank. Normally you shoot like 200 photo to 300 photo for one tank is common. Sometimes 600 if I have to do two times. And this is the championship that I won so far. Two for IAPLC, two for IIC, 
two for AGA and one for CIAC China. Now I would like to show you some of my tanks that I've done before. Of course, I will not show you every tank, uh, just I will pick up some just to share with you. 2008, this is my very first tank. You can laugh, no problem. <laughs> Everybody laughs at this tank. It's better than mine. And yeah. I show them in the videos, I, my tanks before. I'm very proud. Every time I like to show this tank to my friends or to some beginners, because I want to tell them that if I started with this tank, a tank like this, and I can achieve my level now, all of you can do the same. I'm sure all of you started with a better tank than this one. So if I'm started with something like this, you can do better than me. So I like to always encourage people, don't give up. No matter how, let's say, how not nice your tanks are now, just look at my tank. This is how I started my hobby. So be proud of yourself and keep trying. 2009, this is my tank in 2009. It won number four in IPLC that year. My first time participating in IPLC, I got number four. And I'm the first person in the world that used straight wood in aquascaping. You can go and check. Before 2009, nobody used straight wood before. I'm the first person. So this is also a message that don't be afraid to use new stuff. When I told my friend I'm going to use this thing, they are laughing at me. They say, you can go and buy the broom stick. Yeah. <laughs> but I got number four. So I, this is a message that I want to tell you. Be bold. You know, don't, don't be afraid to try new stuff. 2010, I made this tank after my trip to Austria for skiing. 2011, 2012, 13, 14, 15, 16. 2017 is a very special year for me. In this year, I won three world championships in the same year, using the same concept, different tanks, same concept, same fish. Uh, it took me 11 months to finish these three tanks. So this is the tank that I won world champion in China, in Taiwan. In Japan. Two thousand eighteen, this tank also won number one in uh, Taiwan, and this is my ADA tank last year. So this year, I make three tanks: two tanks for Taiwan and one tank for Japan. So this is uh, my tank for Taiwan I IAC this year. It got number four, and this got number two in the same contest. So actually, guys, you have to know that this is aired after the ceremony. So right now you're going to see his 2019 award-winning tank. Here it is. Our topic for today, this workshop. Initially, when I come here, I have in mind that we want to do this. I want to give, to share some tips on international competition, how to do well in international competition. But after that, I realized that not everyone is going for international competition. Some of you might be just want to do a beautiful tank at home and to enjoy it, to relax. It doesn't matter. Both are good. Yeah, not everyone is a contest guy like me. Some of you just like to have a nice thing at home. So the two topic for today can be also the tips for creating good layout. It's the same. You can use the same tip for contest, or you can use the same tips just to create a nice thing. Before that, I want to tell you or to share with you there are two extreme styles in aquascaping. This is important because um, I belong to one of the styles. And if I want to share with you my tips, my tips will be more related to that style. Yeah? So if you ask the people from the other style, they may not agree that what, whatever that I'm saying. So there are two extreme ends to, to aquascaping. I call them zen and wild. Of course, there are something in between as well, but what I'm trying to say now is the two extreme. Yeah? Very, very extreme style. A zen style aquascape is very relaxing, 
very calm, peaceful, simple, simplicity, soothing. So when you look at a Zen kind of scape, you feel very relaxed, your mind very calm, you very peaceful, you, you enjoy it. So this is a Zen style of aquascaping. The wild aquascaping style, it gives you very high impact and it makes you feel like very dangerous, like maybe something going to fall down or something like that. And melancholy means a very agey. It, it makes you don't feel very comfortable. You feel like you, you don't feel very like a, a bit scared, dark, mysterious. So these are the two extreme style of aquascaping. And I want to show you some of the information about these two styles. First, Zen, fundamental skill is very important. Meaning you need to really know the basic to do a Zen layout well. If you do not know the basic, it is difficult to do. Because in Zen aquascaping, the weaknesses is easily exposed. Because it's very simple. When you do something very simple, your weakness shows. So you need very, very good fundamental skill to do a Zen style aquascaping well. Yeah? Safe but hard to break through. Means this is for contest, contest uh, related speaking. If they say you are doing something Zen, you will not get very, very terrible ranking. But it is so very difficult to achieve very, very high ranking. This is what I meant. Safe but difficult to break through because it is it won't go too wrong, but if you want to get very good ranking, very difficult. Difficult to understand and difficult to master. And it depends on experience and skill, meaning it takes a lot of time to master this Zen style of aquascaping. Now let's look at the wow. Basic skill is not crucial. I'm not saying that it is not important. It is not as demanding and this style. Meaning if you are, if, even if your basic skill is not that good, if you are doing the wow style, maybe you can get, get on with it because the weakness can be hidden. When you are doing something wild and you make some mistake, people don't see your mistake because people, are, the attention is being focused on the wild side. A small mistake they don't see. For the Zen, because it's very simple, a small mistake people see it. So this is the difference. Big risk, big reward. If you are doing something wild, you can get like thousands of ranking. And if you hit the right spot, immediately it brings you to the top. So this is the difference. And it depends a lot on inspiration and creativity. It means idea. For wild sites, idea is very important. If you had a good idea, you can do it. You do not need experience or skill. I'm the perfect example. I have to tell you that I, I'm still learning but I'm more doing this side. That is why my result is still okay, even though I still make mistakes. Yeah? I would like to show you now uh, some people that is belong, who is belong to this group and that group. For the, for the Zen group, these are the master in the Zen. I'm not sure, I, I hope that you, you know some of this. Masashi Ono, Japan. Ngo Trong Tin from Vietnam. This is the IPLC champion. Cliff Hui from Hong Kong. Handa-san is the last year's uh, IPLC champion for Japan and the Brazilian. So these are more or less the Zen representative. The wild side, Fukada, Wang Chao from China, Long from Vietnam, Wolinski from France, and myself. And if I look at Green Aqua, okay, Balash is probably the wild, the wild, wild side. Victor is probably this side. So, this is to just to give you a picture, what kind of two extreme style in aquascaping. So today, the tips that I'm going to share with you is more the wild side. If you want to hear the Zen side, you get this guy to come. Yes. Yeah? <laughs> okay, quiz time. Who is the most handsome aquascaper in the world? Joseph, good answer, quiz. <laughs> Many people call me aquascaping master. Uh, just because I, I, I won some contests and, and all this, people start to call me aquascaping master. Basically, before 2017, 
Nobody called me aquascaping master. And because 2017, I won a few awards, a few world champions, people start to call me aquascaping master. To me, I can't become a master from one year to another year. 2016, I'm not aquascaping master. 2016, at 17, suddenly I become aquascaping master. Why? I don't think this is true. So I want to tell you, I am not an aquascaping master. Balaj don't like this slide, I know. He I said don't he like will, it at he all. He edit it out. But I actually, I told you before that I thought of you as an aquascaping master even before you got the prize. Yeah, and that. Victor here <laughs> will be testify for that because actually Victor also heard me say that. Because I belong to the wild side, you don't see my mistake. But I know I make mistakes. And I think aquascaping masters don't make so many mistakes. So what, what I'll tell you today is that I'm just someone who know a little bit about contests. I'm a very competitive guy. I do my tanks with a very clear mind that I want to go for contests. So by winning all these contests doesn't make me a master. It only makes me an aquascaping contest master. That may be yes. I am a very uh, competitive guy. So I started this hobby because I want to go for contests. Who would you consider an aquascaping master? You are going to put me in a lot of trouble with this question. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, there are many. You, you have seen somebody who set up that tank was here a few, few months ago. There are many. Japanese master, many. But I, I don't want to mention who and who because those people that I don't mention, they are going to hate me forever. Now today, I'm going to share with you uh, nine useful techniques in creating a good layout. Whether you're going for contest or not, it doesn't matter. The first one, very, very important theme. Theme is actually something that tell people what you do in your tank. Something that represents the identity of your tank. Meaning, um, if you do something, do something, people see it, immediately they know what you are doing. That is a theme. A theme can be many things. It can be forest, river, waterfall, mountain range, cliff, canyon, canyon valley, trees, uh, blah, blah, NA, Dutch, Iwakumi. Anything can be your theme but it must be very clear. And why is, it, is a theme important? Why? Because for our viewers or judges, they, if they understand what you are doing, they like it, they, they can appreciate. If we see something that we don't understand, you don't like it. But if you see something that you understand, you will like it. So that is why a theme is very, very important. You, we always have to treat the viewers or the judges as normal people. We are not making something for experts. You have to treat everybody as a kid that can appreciate your tanks. A good tank, not only some one expert will appreciate, you need to make a tank so that even kids can understand and like it. And that, a theme will help because everybody will understand if your theme is clear. And this is important because you don't have any chances to explain to the judges or the viewer what you are doing. You have zero chance. What the judges see is your photo, and that is the only thing they see. You don't get the chance to explain to the judges, I'm doing this because of what, I'm doing this because of what. No, you have zero chance to do that. So what you have is a photo. Uh, back in Malaysia, I have many new, let's say, beginner friends who show me their photo, and then they start to explain to me, I'm doing this one because I want to do that, the, this color because I want to do that. And deep down in my mind, I think, if you have to start explaining your work to me, you fail. You don't have a chance to explain. Whatever you have is in that photo only. So that is why a theme is important. For example, if I show this abstract drawing to 100 people on the street, Maybe three, maybe five people will say, yeah, this is nice, I like it. The rest of the 90 people, they don't understand it. But if I show this photo to 100 people on the street, maybe 80 people will say, yeah, I like it. Because this is easy to understand. People know that this is a forest. So this is hmm, no theme, abstract. This is with a theme. So you, you, we have to do something that people can easily understand what you're doing. Same thing here. If I show these two ladies painting to anyone, most of us will say, this is nicer, this is not so nice. Because 
we know that normally a lady look like that. A lady doesn't look like that. But it doesn't mean that this is a bad, bad painting. This could worth 100 million euro. This could worth $20. It, it doesn't mean that this is bad, this is good. But if you show, to a, show this painting to a normal people, many will think this is a better drawing. So make sure your theme is easily understandable. You know, in, in, if you look at the social media today, Facebook or Instagram or whatever, forum or, many people will say, I do forest tank or I do mountain tank, whatever. So when people say, I do forest tank, they show a photo like this. They say, this is a forest tank. Or they say, this is a forest tank. Or this is forest. This is not forest. These are not forest because, the, yeah, he, he has a theme. The theme is forest, but how can we know that this is a forest? Without that person tell me that he's doing a forest, and even if he told me he's doing a forest, I also do not understand this is a forest. So these are not forests. These are forests. So if you do a thing like this, you don't have to tell people you are doing forest. One look, you know these are forests. So these are the important thing about uh, your theme must be easily understandable. So how to create a good layout with a theme? How to do it? This is important. And to answer this question, I need a volunteer to demonstrate. Today, you have a very important task. Mm -hmm. You need to demonstrate to the audience how to create a good theme. Okay? okay? And I have a theme for you. You need to create for us. Okay. This is a theme. I want you to use Lego to build a big house with beautiful gardens, flowers and trees in the garden, butterflies flying around, two dogs chasing the butterfly, two sports cars in the car porch, a swimming pool with girls in bikinis. Ready? Okay. You do not need a mic now. You have four pieces of Lego. Please use these four pieces of Lego, create this theme for us. You can start now. <laughs> Please use your imagination. Try to do all these one, two, three, four, five, six things with yes, with these four pieces of Lego. Please, you can start now. Done? Done. Okay, <laughs> great. Ladies and gentlemen, these are a big house with beautiful gardens, flowers, and uh, butterflies and dogs. And where's the beginnings, girls? Uh, behind. Behind. Okay. He is. You see, he is explaining to me now. He's explaining to me the beginning girls are behind. But if I give to a judge, can you see a beginning girls here? You can't see. Yeah? So, but anyway, this is a good demonstration. And for your effort, I have a small present for you as well. For you, Congo. Thank you. Thank you for your effort. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. So, ladies and gentlemen, four pieces of Lego to create this theme, you will know by now it is impossible. You can never create any thing nice with a few pieces of Lego. To create the theme that we are trying to do just now, you need a full set of Lego. That is how you create a theme. With a few pieces of Lego, you can't even create a big house, not to mention bikini acres. Yeah, so just remember, when you want to create a theme, you think about Lego. This is a hardscape that I created in 2016. And to create this hardscape, I use 50 pieces of wood, more than 50 pieces of wood, and more than 100 pieces of rock. This is not even planting or anything, but I hope that you already understand what I try to do. This, the theme itself is already very clear. Just by looking at hardscape, because I have enough stuff for me to create. There are a lot of, uh, let's say, some uh, beginners or some, somebody who go to an uh, aquascaping shop, and he just buy five pieces of rock, he go home, he need to use these five pieces of rock to create something. So no matter what, you need to use that five pieces of rock that you buy. You don't have any choices. Or you buy two pieces of wood, and then you put in, you are expecting these two pieces of wood to create a theme that you want. Impossible. Unless you are very, 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 very lucky. But how, 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 how many people can be so lucky that you go to a shop, pick up something, you put in, that is exactly what you want. Not possible. So to create a theme, you really need a lot of material to choose. And many people complain to say that I cannot find the wood that I want. Because you have an image in your mind that you want to create 
a wood like this, and you go to shop A, shop B, shop C, you cannot find a piece of wood. I can tell you, you can never find it anywhere. You need to create it yourself. Get a few pieces of wood, try to combine it like Lego. You go to a shop, a Lego shop, you can never find one piece of Lego that, that have the whole thing that you want. You have to buy a set and then you have to put them together. Can you tell me in the meantime what kind of wood and what kind of rocks did you use there? The rocks, I collected it from some wild rivers in Malaysia. I use this kind of rock only for, let's say, skate that the rock is not the main focus point. Because this kind of rock, it do not have a very unique texture. It is good for supporting, but it cannot be the main piece. Like you see those rocks with the main piece, all have very beautiful texture and all this. These rocks are good for supporting. I collected from some wild river or some water waterfall back in Malaysia. This wood, we call it, I don't know the actual name, we call it Thai driftwood from Thailand. It's very fine, very, actually very brittle. It can break it easily, but once you put it in, once it's inside the water, it, they, they won't break. But if they say, you take it out from water, it's, it, they break easily. These are some, some mixture of ironwood and the red wood. Yeah. Would you be afraid that the, the small Taiwan wood would, uh, would melt? No, they won't melt. They will break only. They won't melt. They are really solid wood, but because they are very thin, so sometimes during maintenance, they can break. So from this to this, the theme is clear. By one look, you know exactly what I want to do. I don't need to explain to you what I want to do. You know. And to create this, you really need a lot of material to do it. Yeah? And some will ask me, uh, how about this? This is also my tank. Basically, people see it, one piece of wood, two piece, three piece, maybe four piece. Only four piece of wood. But I want to tell you, it's not that easy. As I told you just now, to create this piece, I already need 20 pieces. You can never go to an aquarium shop and you, you say you want to find a piece of wood like this. Good luck. You can never find it. Technique number two, death. Everybody know death, but not many people can do it well. Why? I will show you. First of all, why is death so important? Because I think, first of all, it look your layout look big, look deep. People go wow. If you if your your tank has very good depth, it is very easy to impress viewer. Because to me, death is a. Uh, how do I call it? It is something very easy to see. You do not need to be an expert to see a tank that is with good depth. Very easy to, 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 to let people understand what is depth. I haven't come across anybody who do not like a tank with good depth. Whenever you see a tank, the very first thing that you notice probably is depth. What you see, wow, this tank very deep. Very first thing that comes to your mind always is depth. So it is something very easy to impress the viewer and the judges. And how to create depth? End point, do you know, anybody know end point, right? Vanishing point, uh, this is end point, for example. A point that is uh, demonstrating the more far end of your tank. High background, this one everybody know. If you want to have good depth, your background has to be high. Use something big in front, something small at the back. These three things, everybody do, but that is not the important thing. Many people forgot the last thing, which is to me, the most important thing, perspective. To create good depth, you need perspective. And what is perspective? You know, when I, when I was young, small, I draw houses like this. This has no perspective. And when I'm older, I draw houses like this. This is perspective. You need to have this perspective, this perspective. Without this perspective, your tank will not be looking deep. Perspective is very important. Okay? Let's look at the Congo tank in 2017. I have my end point here. High background, this tank has very high background, like maybe 30 cm high, the background. Front big, back small, yes. I use smaller wood at the back, bigger wood at the, in front. How about perspective? You see this perspective, this perspective, and this perspective. 
So I am creating this kind of perspective to demonstrate the tank has some depth. Without this perspective, even though you have the, the first three, the depth is not good enough. Let's look at the Fukada's tank. Endpoint, he has a very beautiful endpoint here. Very beautiful. High background, actually this tank do not have high background. Front big, back small, yes. You have small things at the back, big things in the front. But I want you to look at his perspective. Crazy perspective, you see this, 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 and this. He's creating so many perspectives and making the tank look so deep, even though he do not have high background. So perspective is everything when you want to create depth. You want to show this kind of, this kind of perspective. You just look at how Fukada demonstrates the perspective, crazy perspective. I think only a true master can do this. Yeah? Also his tank, you see? End point, he has end point. High background, high background. I saw this tank also personally in his house. Very beautiful, high background. Front big, back small, yes. He used very small wood at the back and uh, big wood in front. And perspective, yes, he has good perspective. Can you tell me the size of this tank? 100, 150. The previous one, 120. Fugata has two tanks, 120 and 150. Same like me, I also same. Can you talk a little bit about the size of the tank depth-wise and why is it important to have deep tanks? Um, my tank is normally 140 or, uh, 120 or 150, uh, 20, 120 or 150, 60, or some tank is 50, and the depth is always 60, always 60. Because to create that kind of uh, depth and layers, the, the deeper it is, you have more room, more space to work. But of course, you need to have enough idea to fill the tank. Number three, focal point. This one also, I think everyone will know, but I just want to just go through. Focal point is important, why? Because it helps to catch the viewer's attention and it guides the viewer's eyes. We need to know that when judges in aquascaping contest, they have hundreds of thousands of photos to look at, right? And if your tank do not have something to catch their eyes, they will just flip it and they forget it. So to create the focal point, you need something big and something special, like the tank that Dave did. The rock is very big, very special. That is a focal point. You need something very bright or something very dark. Brightness and darkness can also be your focal point. You need an end point. End point can be also your focal point. And always the focal point you put at a golden ratio, two, three in the middle. Golden ratio, I think everybody would know. For example, this tank, this is a focal point. I use a very, very big and dark wood to create a focal point. So the first thing you see is this thing. And from here, the viewers will, first they will stop their eyes or attention on this wood and slowly from this wood, they will see the other thing, yeah? This is another extreme example. I use very bright end point as my focal point. So when, when you see this tank, the first thing you see is this thing. A tank without a focal point, can it be good? Yes, it can. I give you an example, very good example. I don't find many examples in this case, but this tank is a fantastic example from Walensky. I do not know where is the focal point. No focal point, but how many people can do a tank like this where you do not need a focal point, but the moment you see it, you cannot take your eyes off. The lack of the focal point in this tank was not created by Gregoire, but it was created by Evo Kedves, a Hungarian concept artist, because actually saw, what Gregoire yes. did is that he took the image and yes, he took that as a, as a consideration. A rare example. How many people can be Wodinski? Not many people can be him. So, I, I want to say that it's not necessary, you must have a focal point, but unless you can do something like that, otherwise you need a focal point. I want to show you some example of the tanks that do not have a clear focal point. Something like this. A beautiful tank, but where is the focal point, I do not know. Because at the back, there are a lot of white area. I do not see a very clear focal point in this tank. 
Again, very beautiful tank, but where is the focal point? When you look at tank like this, yeah, very nice, but after a while you forget about it because there's nothing that can register in your mind about this tank. Very nice. I'm not saying this is a very nice tank, but after very soon, you forget about this tank because there's nothing for you to, to focus on. Same thing. No focal point to me. Beautiful tank, no focal point. Same thing. So remember, creating something with a very clear focal point to catch attention of the viewer, of the judges. We come to technique number four, layers. And I have to say this is a little bit more difficult to explain. I'll try my best. Layers help to create depth. It makes your tank look richer in content. And it creates 3D effect. This is something I would say very, very important in today's aquascaping. If you want to go for contest, your tank needs to look 3D. I will explain to you. So to create layers, first of all, we don't arrange everything in straight, one dimension straight. You don't put your wood like this in a straight line. This will not give you layers. You need to do something at the back, something in front, and don't use the same, everything same size. The rock has to be big, small. Wood has to be chunky, thin, and different colors, different materials to create layers. Many people do tanks, they only see one dimensional. I think in today's, if you're really going to do well, if you want to do well in contests, you need to do three dimensional. This is one dimensional. Many people do their tanks, they draw this on their tanks and they start to put in the husk. To me, this is one dimensional. You only see your tank as one piece of paper like this. One dimensional. Yeah. Ah, show my name. The most handsome aquascaper. Yeah. This is not good enough. If you want to do 3D, you need to imagine your tank this way. I don't know how many of you, when you set up your tanks, you have this cube in your mind. You need to, if you want to do 3D. So you're not only doing something on this level. You need to consider the second level, the third level, and maybe fourth, fifth level. You need to have your mind, your tank is not only a piece of paper, but a cube. Do something in front, and then at the back, something else, at the back, something else. Three dimensional. This tank, I want to show you the layers in this tank. The first layer, easy, is the sand. Layer number two, to me, is the two piece of wood. This two piece of wood is one layer. They are, they are at the same dimension. So this is second, after the sand, this is a second layer. So you can feel that this sand and this wood, are, they are two different dimensions. They are not together. They are two different dimensions. The third layer is the empty area behind these two pieces of big wood. This empty area. This empty area, you also can feel that it is different from these two pieces of wood. It is behind the two pieces of wood. The fourth layer is all the plants here. You can also feel that these plants are behind this area. Very clearly, you can, you can know it. The fifth layer is the end point. So this tank has five layers. I think a good tank needs to have at least five layers. Let's look at Fugada's tanks. The first layer, of course, is again the, the sand. The second layer is the higher root or the structure after the sand. You can, you can know that this layer and these layers are, they are different height. Third layer is these two big things. This one and this one, yeah? The fourth layer, to me, this is the most beautiful layer in his layout. Actually, when you see this tank in real life, this area is sink down. It creates a very nice illusion that this tank is like very deep. Yeah? Very beautiful layer. I, I like this layer very much. And then there is one layer, the wood at the back. And one more layer, the, the, the empty end point here. So six layers. I don't see many tanks with six layers. 
Fukada can do it. Now I want to show you an example of a tank that do not have enough layers. This again is a beautiful tank, but to me, the layers is not enough. How many layers do we see? The stand is one layer. But unfortunately, everything else, this everything else is one layer because they, they are at the same dimension. All this, all this thing, you don't see anything in front, you don't see anything at the back. It's all one dimension. And then you have the end point there, three layers. Three layers is very easy to do. Anybody can do three layers, but it's not enough in today's aquascaping. Four is already good enough. Five will be the best. Six is impossible, except Fugada. Shadow. I don't know how many of you think when you set up your tank, you have shadow in your mind. I tell you a story. In 2016, I visited uh, Fukada's house. That year, he won the second IPLC. He won the first time 2015. 2016, he won for the second time straight. So on that year, I visited his house. I asked him, what is your secret in winning IPLC? He only gave me one word, shadow. Then I was, what shadow? And now I understand Shadow is very, very important. So let's see. Shadow helps you to create a moody kind of feel, mysterious. It gives your tank power and it helps to create fear. Shadow, dark stuff is fear. And melancholy, AG, means you, you give people an uneasy feeling. And this is exactly how the wild style people will tell you this is important. If you go and see Fugada's tank, past tank, he has all these elements. Fugada's tank is never give you a very peaceful feeling. When you look at Fugada's tank, dark, dangerous, AG, it makes you feel uneasy. And that is exactly something that win him two times IPLC champion. Many people will think I want to create a tank that look comfortable, look peaceful. Yeah, but that is not going to I, I wouldn't say not. It's very difficult to give you the top prices. As I say, you need to be very, very good. If you're creating something very comfortable, you need to be very good. Otherwise, people don't look at it. Fukada, and now actually I'm, I would say being influenced by him. My style is more or less this. I want to create this element in my tank. So to create shadow, Actually, it's very, very simple. Everybody know that you need object that block lights. This is your light. This is your object. And this part, if the light cannot get to it, you get shadow. So very simple. Imagine this is your wood or your rock. How to create shadow? You put like this. Don't put everything straight. It is not going to get shadow if you put like this. You put like this. This is your shadow. So this has to be implemented when you set up your tank. It is too late to do it when after the water is in. Or you can create shadow by using plants. If you have something straight, you put plants here. Maybe bobitis or some ferns here. And this part will be dark. This is after you have set up and then you say, shit, where is my shadow? So you, you put some plants on top here. At the bottom, you can get shadow. But I, I think it's very important. I think not many people will have shadow in your mind when you first create a tank. But learn from Master Fugada. He has shadow and shadow only in his mind. I, 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 I tell you, only shadow in his mind. So when you create a hardscape, wood, uh, rock, first have shadow in your mind. Try to see how do you want to create shadow. Okay, put something like this, not like this. Of course, you cannot do everything like this, otherwise your tank is black. So you need to know what kind of shadow is good and how much shadow is needed. Exactly my question. How much shadow is required? A tank, how many percent of shadow is good shadow? Personally, I feel 30 to 60%. I know it sounds crazy. Imagine 30 to 60% of your tank is dark, but that is exactly how the top aquascapers are doing. I show you an example. 
this tank, how many percentage of shadow? I roughly estimated 30 to 40 percent of shadows. This tank from Wang Chao, China, you see the shadow that he have. 40, 50 percent of this tank is shadow. Yeah, all these are shadow. You see, all these. I didn't. I did not circle it because all these are shadow. All these are shadow. 40, 50 percent. I call the grandmaster of shadow, Fugada's tank. This tank, 50 to 60 percent are shadow. All these are shadow, but you don't feel that it is very dark. This tank gives you a kind of feeling that it is unique to me. This is Fukada's best tank. Personally, I feel Fukada's best tank. Very unique feel. And he has 50 to 60% of this tank is shadow. So a lot of people think that uh, a tank must be bright, must be, you know, I think that kind of thinking is outdated. Your tank must have enough shadow to create that kind of impact. Of course, I'm speaking from the wild school. The Zen school will not think this way. Yeah? Same. This Indonesian tank, my friend, 50-60% of tank is shadow, but it looks very impressive. But one thing you have to remember, when you create shadows, don't make it totally dark. A totally dark shadow is not a good shadow. When you create shadow, you want people to see a little bit inside the shadow show a little bit of details inside the shadow. Don't, don't make it totally dark. If a shadow is totally dark, yes, okay, but not a very good shadow. This tank, all this shadow inside have details. Of course, now I projected in the slide, you cannot see the detail too much, but all this inside have, have details. All these shadows has detail inside. Fugara's tank, all this you can see a little bit of stuff inside. Some roots, fish, some plants. So these shadows are never totally dark. You want to see a little bit of details inside the shadows. I want to show you now some example of layout that do not have enough shadow. This thing. To me, these are not shadow. It doesn't give me an area where it is dark or area that is bright. Not enough shadow. Thing like this, of course, actually now I projected it out, everything looked very dark. If, but, but if you see it from your laptop or from the real, th these are not shadow. And as I tell just now, as I, shadow doesn't mean darkness. This tank is too dark. Shadow doesn't mean darkness. We need good shadow and good brightness to complement each other. A good tank must have very clear shadow and very clear brightness. Again, I show Fugada's tank. This tank has 60 to 70% of shadow. You can imagine how all these are shadows. All these big stars are shadows close to 70% are shadow, and it has very beautiful br bright area. That is what I meant. You need good brightness and good shadow to complement each other. Do you consider the position of lightning before you start to work on your hardscape? Yes. The brightness, you mean? Uh, yes, I mean, because of the shadows. You cannot just think True. of the light in the one-way direction. Maybe you position it. The first very good question he, he's asking, uh, just now I say, when I set up the hardscape, I already consider how to create a shadow. But how about the brightness? Yes, it is in my initial plan. The first thing that in my mind is the end point. The end point is always the main source of my brightness. If you have an end point, the end point must be bright enough to complement the shadow. So the first thing that I have in mind is where is my end point. I already planned my end point. In normally, in a few years back, I will take a piece of paper, at the back, I will stick at the back. This is my end point. Because very often when aquascaper, when, when we set up, you get too excited and you so pump up and you, you do everything and find out, hey, where is my end point? It's gone. You, you cover everything. So let's say a few years back, I always take a piece of paper. I stick at the back. OK, for example, this tank, this is my end point. I stick the paper here. I want to make sure whatever I do, I don't cover this area. So that is how I plan my brightness. Because endpoint is always bright. You cannot have a dark endpoint. After the tank is done, and if you see that your shadow is not enough, uh, do it with plants. Do you position the light in a special direction just to no. highlight the no. effect? My light is always straight up. I, I do not tilt my light uh, in a special position. But during the final photo shoot, yes. 
Uh, I use the studio lights. I don't know how, what is the name, the, the professional studio lights that you go to a studio to take photo, they, they, all this big light. I use that to shoot my tanks. And sometimes if I want to see certain position darker, I use some kind of things to cover the, the top. Normally, normally it happens, it's this corner and this corner. You can see this corner and this corner is mostly dark because these two corners are the closest thing to the viewer normally. And the thing that is closer to you normally is looking dark. The thing that is very far normally is bright. So sometimes it happens that after I shoot my photo, I see from the computer, this area and this area are too bright because of that, that thing that I have. It's very strong. So what I do is I cover something, whatever you can use, maybe some, and you, I don't want it to be totally dark as well. So sometimes I use mesh, some mesh like stocking, the lady stocking, some uh, net, mm -hmm. or something that is some, uh, let's say some garbage bag, plastic that is black color, but the light can still penetrate a little bit. You have to try the error, no fixed formula. If you want to have certain dark spot, cover it. It, it gives you a little bit of uh, darkness. Yeah, so this is something that we do uh, a second thought, meaning nothing you can do already on your stand, but during photo shooting, you can have this kind of small tricks yeah, to cover, to, to create some dark spot. But normally, you, you, you can't do it in the center. Normally, I do is this and this corner. Let's go to the six tips or six techniques, space. The first thing that I want to say about space is that we have to make use of every inch of your tank, every inch. Every inch means from left to right, from front to back, from bottom to top. Every inch of your tank, you need to use it. Very often I see tanks or contest tank photo people only use half of the tank. The top half are all empty. When you submit a photo, you want to give the judges or the viewer as much thing to see as possible. You don't leave a tank empty. First, so make use of every inch of your tank. Every inch, make use of it. And even if, let's say, there is some area that you want, to, you want it to be empty, you purposely want it to be empty, which is fine. For example, this area, you want it to be empty, this is okay, because you plan it to be empty. But you don't do it like, uh, you, you, you leave it empty because you don't know what, how to do it. This one is not okay. Use every inch of your tank, and make good use of the reflection, two types of reflection, left and right reflection, and the top reflection, the, the water surface reflection. Many people do not use the water surface reflection, because all your layouts, are at the bottom. And when you lay us at the bottom, the, the top reflection is empty. If you go and see those uh, top ranking tanks, the top reflections are all full of stuff. Yeah? You don't have to build your, your stuff all the way to the water surface. It's not needed. Just remember, when you take photo, reduce the water level. Many people think, can I reduce the water level? Am I cheating? No, you are not cheating. Just reduce the water. For example, this tank. If you take the photo now, you can see this part is empty. To me, this tank is nice, but if you want to go for contest photo, reduce the water level until you can see the top reflection. Of course, you don't have to do that, but you can do that. That is why I say make good use of reflection, left and right and top. I wanted to ask you about the reflection that you are using in this year's contest tank. I know that you are using the reflection in very creative ways on both sides. And actually I like the way that you have like a separate tank on the left and the right side. Like you have three tanks in one picture. How did you do that? And did you do that on purpose? Obviously you did. Uh, yes and no. Uh, left and right reflection, there are two ways to do it. One is that you want to show people continuation. You want to let people have an illusion that your tank is longer than this. Longer than this. For example, your tank only this big, 
but with the left and right reflection, you want to show the viewers or the judges that your tank is actually longer. This is a very useful technique because um, a good tank always look bigger than it, the actual one. If you have a two feet tank and you show it to people, people say, this is a four feet tank, you are doing something good. If you have four feet tank, you show people, people say, this is a two feet tank, then you are not doing something good. So you want to extend your tank to make it look bigger. So this is one of the usage of the, uh, the reflection. And just now, Balash asked the question, in my this year's context tank, I am not using this technique. Because the second usage for reflection, where I want to show people, as he said, a different kind of dimension. If I say, well, I want to extend the tank to be longer, I use plants. Normally, this tank, this tank exactly, you can see the reflection. Can you, can you see the reflection? You can see the reflection on this side and this side. These are the extension. This is the extension. So if you take a photo, actually this tank is six feet maybe, you, you look longer than six feet. Because the reflection is a continuation of the scape here. In my this year uh, IPLC tank, I don't have this extension, but my reflection looks totally different from what is inside the tank. That's what Bala say, it is like a different tank. This one, you need to use hardscape, the wood and the rock. In this case, I'm using the rock. And you cannot use a rock that it is uniform in shape. If you use a rock that is round or uniform in shape, the reflection will look exactly the same. So you need to use some, some, some kind of a rock or wood that it is maybe something like this, not in unique shape. So actually the reflection will, will, will show a totally different image from this one. If you use something that it is round, the, the reflection will look exactly the same. So use something unique, the reflection will, will, will show something totally different. So, so this is how uh, I, I, I try to create. If you want to have reflection, you need to plan it during the hardscape stage. Otherwise, you, you cannot do it otherwise. Yeah, you need to, this one you need to practice a little bit, how to have reflection. I've got another question about the reflection and this one is about the top of the tank. Uh, we are sometimes using uh, hair dryers to move the surface. What is your opinion on using hair dryers and, uh, versus having just a flat surface with normal reflection on? Personally, I'm a, a big fan of hair dryer. Uh, I, my tank never have a uh, calm surface. It's always with ripples, hair dryer surface. I do not want to show a mirror effects. Because if you have a water surface reflection and if you are not using hair dryer, it's always a mirror effects. So whatever that is here, it is like a mirror on top. I, I, personally, I, I feel that this is like too symmetrical. I don't like something that it is looking very symmetrical top and bottom. So I use the hair dryer to break these symmetrical effects to, to make the, the top portion look a bit, um, let's say, having some ripples. So I, I'm, I'm a big fan of uh, this uh, ripple hair dryer effects. But if you are doing something more in the Zen school, something calm, something more soothing, without the hair dryer, it's fine to me. Yeah, and actually, the hair dryer will also help to, to give a bit of a... Of course, I'm coming from the wild side, but uh, the hair dryer gives you a bit of this uh, mysterious feeling. Like, you, you don't want people to see too clear. You, you want to make it like a bit wavy and all this. Personally, I, I, I like hair dryer. So normally, my hair dryer is tied on the... Because I only, I'm, I'm only doing it one person, so I tie my hair dryers on the light stand. Give the audiences as many things to look at as possible. This is actually almost the same. So when you submit a tank photo to the judges, this is the only thing that you have for the judges or for the viewers. And if your content or your hardscape or your things is only half, you are wasting all the empty space. So imagine you only have this piece of paper or photo to show it to the judges. Give them as many things to see as possible. So fill up your tanks. And if you can't fill up your tank, lower down the water. You see all these award-winning tanks. 
left to right, bottom to top, front to back. Everywhere is filled up. Of course, you, you ask, what about this empty space? This empty space is purposely created. It is not left empty. Fugada want to create all this empty space on purpose. Same. This empty space, empty space, empty space, empty space. We created it on purpose. If you create an empty space on purpose, it is fine. But you cannot leave it empty for no purpose. Fill up your tank. But nobody wants to see a tank that is too congested, too full. So the question is, how do we fill up a tank without creating this congested feeling? Also, many people fill up their tanks, but when you look at their tank, you feel like you cannot breathe. It's like too congested. How to do it? To me, if you do something like this, it looks congested and it is very flat. So you sh we shouldn't do this. You are filling up your tank, but it is congested and flat. What you should do is something like this. Uh, the same thing, you are fill up the, filling up the tank. In fact, if you look at the size of this hardscape, the hardscape here is actually more than the hardscape here. The size, the size here are actually bigger than here. But this tank, it looks spacious. A good tanks always invite the viewer to come in. If you make a tank that is like a wall, the viewers cannot go in. That is not good. A good tank always will give the viewers a kind of feeling that I want to go inside your tank. So you need to have this kind of area to invite people to your tank. I will give you some example. You can use perspective, layers, different layers, and then shadows. Use this tree to create a tank without being too congested. This tank is fully filled up, very full. But he create a very beautiful space here. This space, it makes you feel like you want to go inside your the tank. Even though the, 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 the tank is fully filled up, every single inch of this tank is filled up, but you don't feel very congested. Why? Because this area is very beautifully created, a, a big empty area. And you see the, the perspective, this perspective and the layers, many layers. You can see this is in front, this is at the back, this is at the back, this is at the back. So there is different layers. So with combining the perspective and the layers, he created this very be beautiful space that invite people to go inside. And that is why you feel very nice. Again, this tank, he created this empty space, and this he used the shadow. Shadow is also a good way to, to create space. Yeah? And also this, this small area here, all this, even though the same thing, the tank is fully filled, but you don't feel congested because you have this kind of empty space to invite the viewer to go in. Same thing. This is my tank. I created this big space here with the perspective and many layers. Fugara's tank, he created this space, very beautiful space, this space. And also he used a shadow to create this space and this space. Woriski's tank, he created this space and also the space behind. This space is behind, behind this. I'm talking about this space and also this space behind. So this is a very good 3D demonstration. Now I want to show you some scape that do not have space. This scape, I don't feel that he allowed me to go in because all this thing is like this, like a wall. You don't see the space inside this one. If you want to create a spacious aquascape, we shouldn't do something like that. The next one, I call it integration. Integration means mixing stuff. We want our tank to look like one scene, meaning everything is like together, one scenery, one picture. But we also want the viewers to see different parts of the tanks. It's two, two different extremes. I hope you, you understand what I'm trying to say because uh, first of all, we, we don't want our tank to look like 
they, all the things are individually existed, meaning you can see this rock is not belong to this tank or this plant is not belong to this tank. That is not good. That is not, not, not good integration. But we also do not want to give people a feeling that like if you look at the tank, you cannot differentiate what plants is what plant. All the plants are all messed up and you cannot say what plants is what plant and everything is like too much integration. That is what I meant here. When you talk about integration, there's two things that can do wrong. One is no integration, meaning items exist independently in the scape. Everything is like independent in your, in your tank. No connection, that is not good. Or all items mix up and look messy. This is too much integration. So these are two extreme, all no good. We don't want these two. We want something that is in the middle. I will show you some example. So what is needed to be integrated? Woods and woods, you need integration. Woods and rocks. Basically everything, woods and plants, rocks and plants, all this, in between these two, you need some integration. Everything. Even the reflection, you need to integrate it in your scape. There are some tanks, the integration looks very odd. It, it, it feels like it doesn't belong to this tank. It is, it is not like what I explained just now. It is still part of the tank, but you can feel that it is a different scenes, different angle. But there are some reflection that is like very, very odd. Everything in this tank, it belongs together. But you can still tell that individually, you can still say, okay, this plant, this plant, you can still identify the plant individually, but they are all looking, mixing together. How would you know what kind of reflection do you have on the left and the right side while you're scaping? Because it's not filled up with water, so reflection will be a problem. If you want to see how the reflection looks like, put a mirror here. But I only do it once. Because after that, for so many years, you, you somehow you get the kind of feeling, what kind of uh, reflection you will get. This is a good example. This reflection, just now Balash asked, this reflection doesn't look like it is same as this, but it, is look like, it, it looks like continuation. But this piece, it doesn't look like this piece. It's totally different. If you look at this, you will feel like this is another part of the tank. It doesn't look like this reflection is this reflection. They, they are looking totally different. But to be honest, if you ask me, do I plan the reflection to be this way? I, I didn't. I didn't plan it. Even though the reflection is slightly off, I will accept it. You are lucky. Yeah, I will accept it. <laughs> so I did not purposely want the reflection to look exactly like this. But I know if I use a wood like this, the, the reflection will be different. Because this wood is so unique. If you look at the other side, it, it looks different. I know. This tank is from my good friend, Roger. I say this tank, the integration is not enough. Why? The rock to me is too new. So if you look at this, you will feel that this rock, like, it doesn't belong to this tank. It is too new. Because personally, I know when they shoot this photo, the tank is one over months old. I, I know. He is my good friend. And then actually, if you look at the more higher resolu resolution photo, this Monte Carlo is also, the color also very fresh compared to the overall tank. Monte Carlo, if you leave it long enough, it will grow down. It will grow down. That is very nice. But in this tank, the Monte Carlo haven't grown down yet. It is one patch, one patch, one patch, one patch, one patch. So if you look at the photo from here, you can see very clear. If you look at a clear photo, you can see the Monte Carlo is like very independent. It doesn't, it doesn't belong to this tank. You know that the Monte Carlo is Monte Carlo. This tank is this tank. Same like the rock here. To me, it's a bit too new. This tank, I know that he put in the route not too long before he take the photo. The rest of the tank, maybe, I don't know, two, three months, four months, I don't know. But this route, to me, it looks like just added in not too long ago. Again, this photo doesn't show, but if you look at the actual photo, you will know. And this is another extreme. I call it too much integration. If you look at this, I do, can you tell me what plant he used? I cannot tell you, I cannot tell you what plant he used. All the plants are messed up. To me, this tank has been left too long. It's already over its prime. 
it's already over the right time to take the photo. Too long. I can only see a bit of bobitis. The rest of the plant is just like green. This is what I say, we cannot have too much integration and you cannot have too little integration. You need to know exactly what kind of amount that is needed. Using this kind of uh, example is easier to explain. Just now, I, I, I'm sure that you guys are, will be a little bit blurred if I don't show this kind of uh, example. So this is too much. Just now, this is too little. And OK, one more thing. You see the sand path, too clean. This also shows that, I mean, the sand path is a sand path. The scape is a scape. I cannot connect them together. It, the sand is like very independently there in the tank. It doesn't belong to this tank. It is like the same path and the tank. It, no integration. That is what I mean. How to break this? You can use some small rocks to decorate, small pebbles to decorate, or simply leave it with some algae. A little bit of algae sometimes is good to integrate your tank. This to me, the sand is too new. I think he put on the sand or just clean the sand right before he took the photo. Sometimes too clean is not a good thing. We don't want to, to show people that their tank is too clean. You want to show some, some passage of time to let people know that this tank is matured. If I look at this tank, actually the root and the sand path is a big negative point for me. Too clean. So to create a good integration, as I say, show the passage of time. Let the tank mature and not over matured. You need to find the right time to shoot the photo so that you have the right amount of algae on the sand. The, the plant show the right amount of maturity, but not too much. You need to find the right time. And then planting technique. This is something that I always do. I don't do plants like this plant and this plant and this plant. I always mix them. In nature, you don't see plants that existed individually. In nature, all the plants are mixed up. So this is a planting technique I always use. For example, my foreground. If you see my foreground, I always, for example, I put some mini hair grass mixed with some Monte Carlo or HC, or mix some uh, moss with hair grass so that the hair grass will grow out from the moss. This is a part of integration. Planting is very important. So don't only plant this type of plant here, and then this type of plant here, this type of plant here. We are not selling plant like, like the shop. This is what the shop will do. Because the, in the shop, they cannot mix the plant because they are selling it. But in our, this is a, a good integration. The plants are all mixed. So don't only plant this plant here and this plant here. Try to mix them a little bit. Of course, you need, you need to know what plant can be mixed, what plant cannot be mixed. Otherwise, some of the ag aggressive plant will just eat this plant and this, this will die. So you need to know how, how, how to mix. Uh, this one, is, you need to learn it from uh, experience. And then you need to balance your hardscape and colors and plant. Uh, it means that um, sometimes the colors is, we, we all like to have some red color in the tank, like this, like that. But sometimes the red color is too red that it doesn't mix with the rest of the, the layout. This is nice because it has some red, orange, and even some of the greens are showing some red color. So the very nice integration. But some tank you can see a pure red, and then the rest are very green. It, it looks like it, it doesn't integrate. Hardscape and the plants are the, is the same. We come to number eight, contrast. So what is contrast? Many things. Big and small is contrast. We want our tank to have something big and something small. Not everything same size. Bright and dark, as I explained the shadow just now. Far and near, which is depth. High and low, thick and thin. As I just now I say, fast and slow, can, you can show it through fish. The fish always representing something fast, dynamic. 
and everything else is stagnant, not moving. So that to me is the most important thing of fish in our tank. We want to show this kind of contrast, something that it is moving and something that is not moving. So when you take a tank photo, the fish movement is very important. We don't want the fish to be having that kind of uh, not moving. They, if, if you see some photo, some fish are not moving. That is not nice. You want, to, you want the fish to swim, to create that kind of uh, dynamic feeling. And then the rest of the tank is not moving. That is a contrast for fast and slow. Heavy and light. You want to show something that is heavy in your tank and something that is very light. Dense and loose, it means the plants. In your tank, you should have area that the plants is very dense. Dense means uh, very a lot. And then you want to have some area that you want to only have a little bit of plants to have this contrast and others. So why is contrast important? Contrast can help you to achieve this. Layers, space, focal point, and 3D effect. So that is why we need contrast. Let us look at this tank. What contrast do I have? Do I have big and small? Yes, I have big and small. I have big woods, small woods, rocks, big rocks, and small rocks. Bright and dark, of course I have, and some, some other. Actually, all these are bright, and they are dark area here. Far and near, I have. You can see some, some, something that is uh, closer to us, something that is near, uh, further from us. High and low, yes, I have. This, it really show you the contrast of something very big, and then something that is very low. To create this thing, actually these woods are tied with a fishing line to the top. And I did not remove the fishing line during the photo because when you shoot the photo, the fishing line is gone. Fishing line is transparent. So when you shoot it with light, the fishing line is gone. Otherwise, I cannot position such a big wood at this angle. I don't have the skill of Dave. He can position the, the rock. If I see the rock, I am very scared. Yeah, so, and this wood is huge, it's huge. So I, I cannot position it like at this angle. So I have to, to, to tie it to something else. Yeah, okay. High and low, yeah, we have. Thick and thin, okay, of course we have. We have very thick wood and thin wood. Fast and slow, the fish is, well, the fish is swimming. You can feel that the fish is swimming. And the rest is not moving. Heavy and light, yes. I have very heavy stuff and very light stuff. Dense and loose, yes. I have something that is very dense and something that is more loose. If you see this tank, I, what I have, I have everything except for far and near. To me, I, I, I don't have this thing in this thing. This tank doesn't show us something that is far or near. But it doesn't matter. It doesn't mean that you need to have all. You need to have as many as possible, not to have all. Fugara's tank, he has all. He has all the contrast in this tank. This tank, I think he don't have one thing. He don't have dense and loose. Because to me, this tank, all the plants are equally distributed. You don't have the very dense and very loose. That kind. But it doesn't matter. As I say, we need to have as many as possible, but you do not, do not need to have it all. OK, we come to the last one. Details. Everybody knows details. I'm a guy who value details a lot in my tank. And if I'm a judge, and I, I'm a, I was a judge, and I, I still am a judge for some contest, I look at details very carefully. Details is something that sometimes you do it unintentionally. But if I am a viewer or as, as a judge, if I find some details, I immediately fall in love with the tank. Uh, the, yesterday, I told Balash that uh, the tank that Dave created, he put the pina tifida on the rock, and the root of the pina tifida is growing, hugging the rocks. If you go later, you can go and see. That, to me, is a beautiful detail. Something that you don't create it on purpose, but it happens. And, and this, to me, I, when, the moment I see the tank, I, 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 I fell in love with those roots that is hugging the... Those are very very fine, small things, but it, it moved me. I'm very touched when I see things like this. So details is not for everyone. Some judges, they don't even care what details, all these small things, but some judges like me, if I see this, I will give extra marks. 
details. So details are small things, not big stuff. For example, if you see some roots going out from the rotala, these are details. If you tie the, the whole piece of wood with moss, that is not details. But sometimes, a little bit of moss or physidens growing from the wood, a little bit, that is details to me. If you, if you tie the whole wood with moss, to me that is not, not the detail. But a little bit of moss here, that is details. Or if you use the anubias, the, the root of anubias can also hug the, root, uh, the wood. That is also a beautiful details. Or if you have, let's say you plant some small plants here, let it grow out a little bit. That is also detail. So details are very small thing. As I say, not everybody can look at details. But for people who, like me, know how to look at details, we love it. Intentionally unintentional. Means actually you want people to see your details, but you don't want to show it very intentional. Like you purposely go and put something here and there to show. I think that is not very... You need to show it like very natural. Not something that you intentionally want to put details there. It might not work. And then remember, don't start details from the beginning. It doesn't work. Because details is something very small. If you, from day one, you start to put details, I, I can very sure after two weeks, one month, your details is gone. So normally, I only create my details one month before I shoot my tank. I start to look into details. If you do it when from the start, you cannot maintain the details. They, they'll be gone in, in no time. A tank like this has many, many details. For example, you know this uh, wood that's hanging down? That alone is a detail, but if you look at the photo in a better resolution, you can see actually I tied moss on, on this wood that's coming down. So all these small woods, there are a little bit of moss growing on it. Of course, when you project out like this, you can't see. But if you see a better photo, all these are details because nobody tied moss on such a tiny wood. It's a lot of work, but if you see it, you, you feel that it is special. And you see all these small little plants here, these are details. Even in the very dark area, I, I try to put some, <coughs> some brighter plants. If, you, if I don't put the Pina Tifida here, this whole area will look like full of moss. But if I put a bit of Pina Tifida here, th this are, it gives the, the tank a little, a little bit details that are uh, not so boring, that, that, that kind of feeling. Uh, same, I, I, actually I already explained. Here, if you look at the clearer resolution, this area, there are many small details. These are the nine techniques that I want to share with you today. Actually, it's, it is just as a reference. It is not something that you have to do, a reference. And there could be more things that you can do. These nine things is something that I always do when I prepare for my contest tank. Of course, I do not have a list, like I must do this, I must do this. No, I don't do that. But as I say, I, I'm already in the hobby for 12 years. These things is inside my DNA. I don't have to plan for it, but I know when I do tanks, all my tanks have this nice nine element. I, I don't have a checklist, like I must do, do, do. No, I, I, I don't do that. But if you look at this list and you take any one of my tank, I have, Maybe not, sometimes not all, but at least seven or eight of them. Of course, you, you don't need to have it all. Uh, sometimes you can't. Yeah, but try to, I try to have it as many as possible. I'm doing this thing without me purposely planning to do it. Because I, I'm, in, I'm in this hobby long enough, 12 years, I, I always do this nice stuff in my tank. And I would say that it is so far working quite well for me. I now open to the floor. If you have any question, you can ask now. I'm somewhat confused about where you said earlier that you should fill up the tank, and then you said you should add details after you've set up the tank. How do you reconcile these two things? Good, good question. I mean, what he, he asked is that I say I, I should fill up the tank from 
when, when I do the setup. Don't leave any empty space. But I also say that I should do the details at the last, at the very end. So these two things look or sound contradicting, which is not. Because I also mentioned details is very small thing. I'm not saying that at the end, I add a big piece of rock inside as detail. No, details are very small things. So even though I fill up the tank already, I can still add up a bit of rock here, small rocks, a bit of uh, small woods here and there, small plants. So details are very small things. So I can add, add basically a few weeks before the shooting is fine, as long as the color has to be matched. I don't want my detail to look not integrated. As long as I give enough time for the woods or the rocks to, to have the same color as the rest, it's okay to add at the very end, because it's very small thing, not big things. Can you please explain us what are the techniques that you are using to attach the moss on the okay. hardscape? I'm an old school guy. I use lines. I don't glue my moss. Never. I never glue my moss. I use lines because I feel that if you use line to tie your moss, when it grows, it is looking the most natural one. If you glue your moss, it's simple, very simple. But you need a lot of uh, trimming to let the moss grow it to the way you want it. But tying moss also have different techniques. For me, if I have a, a, a clump of moss, what I do is that I will cut them to very, very small pieces. I don't take the moss and then directly put on rock or wood and then tie. I never do that. A moss, I cut them into maybe one centimeter. Cut them very fine. And then I put them into water. I, I try to loosen them. And then I use all the small pieces of moss to put on the rocks or wood. Why? Because if you just take one clump of moss and put on, on it, first of all, you're wasting a lot of moss. And then they grow very slow. Because the moss, if let's say this is the moss. If you put the whole piece of moss on your rock, they only grow a little bit here. A little bit. They will not grow the full, every single branch, it will not grow. You only grow a little bit. But if you cut the moss into small pieces, every single piece will grow. Of course, there are some scape that you can use dry start. Uh, personally, I only try dry start one time in all these years, one time. I try because I have a big piece of rock that I cannot tie and I don't like to glue. So I dry start the moss on the rock. One time in the 12 years aquascaping journey, you can do that. Personally, I'm not a fan of dry start, but uh, if you feel like you need to do it, do it. Gluing is fine, but um, I feel that when you glue the moss, when they just grow, it doesn't look nice. It doesn't look nice, but uh, it is very convenient to glue. Actually, I, I think it's very convenient to glue, but I'm, as I say, I'm a very old school people. I like to tie moss. And I use a very cheap line, the sewing line, you know, a very, very cheap, dark color, black or green. Where you're getting your inspiration from? We've seen uh, all your guidelines, what you have as an instinct or uh, what you uh, consider when you're building your layout. And uh, we've seen that with uh, Dave, that he's having a lot of scratch, uh, sketch in his sketchbook. So he's kind of like pre-planning or he when he has a good idea, he's making a draft. How about you? When uh, in between the contest, you already have in mind that what you will build next or uh, is it coming suddenly from somewhere or how it's happening with you? If this question is asked by somebody who is interviewing me and want to put my answer in magazine, I will say my, draw, my ideas come from nature, which is a lie. I never get my ideas while exploring nature, to be honest. I also want to say that there are people who get their ideas from the material that they have. For example, in your house, in our house, we have woods and rocks. And then you try to find ideas to suit your rock and to suit your wood. I think this is also a wrong technique. We cannot let our creativity being limited by the material that we have. To me, you need to have the idea first, and then you go and find the material, not the other way around. So to answer your question, uh, my inspiration 
come from everywhere. It can be anything. I want to give an example of Congo, my triple world champion winning tank. The inspiration comes from a movie, Tarzan. And for this year, my inspiration, I accidentally saw some woods around near my house. And then it suddenly just ding, then you have the idea. So it can come from everywhere, from a movie, from, from people around us, and from internet. If you browse internet and look at some photos and all this, why I say that my idea normally don't come from nature. I actually, I, I like to go into jungle a lot, but hardly I get any inspiration to do things from jungle because I like to explore all this jungle or nature photo from internet because those photos from internet are, we know that it is beautiful. If you look at, go to nature, you see mountains, you see plants, you see, but those are, you need to have very special eyes to recognize the beauty. And I think I don't have the special eyes to, to really translate the beauty of, from really nature to a tank. But if I see a photographer already taken the photo from the nature, and I know that this photo is nice because the photographer already do the filter for me. He already do the filter for me. So if you go to nature, you see a lot of plants, a lot of nice things, but I cannot use that in mind. Yeah, but normally, if they say ADA ask me, I will say I get inspiration from nature. All right. I have one last question for you. The question is that you have achieved so much in competitions and you have taken so many prizes home. What can a guy like you do in the future? What are your plans? What do you want to do? Well, as I say in the very beginning, I'm a contest person. If one day I stop doing contest, I may stop to continue this hobby. So I will still go for contest but I feel that I need to slow down. Now, every year I do three, four tanks a year. Tank this big, uh, not this big, this big. Four feet, five feet. Every year, three to four tanks, I feel that I need to slow down. Uh, I think my family needs some more time and myself, I need a little bit more relaxing time. So I, I feel that I will still go for contests, but um, slowing down a little bit. As for what kind of tank I will do, well, I always like to do something new. I, I don't repeat my, my stuff. Yeah, so I, I try to do something new and whether I can find that something new, at the moment, I don't know. So I think maybe in one or two months time, I will start to, this, this question will come to my mind, but now, not yet. I think this is the best, uh tutorial that we have on Green Aqua so far. And I'm pretty sure that one of you guys, future IAPRC champions are watching here in the room or there on YouTube. And th you are going to win because of what Josh no, not, told no, us. No, this is not true, <laughs> this is not true. <laughs> I know you are very humble, but we, even I, have learned so much from here. Congratulations again Thank for you. winning the IAPRC this year. <laughs> Absolutely, and thanks for being here. Thanks for staying here with us. Subscribe to the Green Aqua YouTube channel if you didn't do so yet. And until next week, like this video if you like his, uh, his work today. And until next week, goodbye. Bye. Bye.